So, again, welcome. I have this great, uh, distinct pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker. Uh, he's an old friend of mine, and I think this is the fifth time that Dr. West has come to a symposium that I've had the joy of hosting. And he's a much uh, awarded, widely sought speaker. Uh, Elliot West earned, earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Texas, his PhD from the University of Colorado. He joined the faculty at the University of Arkansas in 1979. Two of his books, Growing Up with the Country, Childhood on the Far Western Frontier, and The Way to the West, Essays on the Central Plains, received the Western Heritage Award. And more recently, his masterpiece, The Contested Plains, Indians, Gold Seekers, and the Rush to Colorado, shown here, uh, received five awards so far, including the prestigious Francis Parkman Prize and the Penn Center Award. His most recent book, which is for sale here this week, is The Last Indian War, The Nez Perce Story, published in 2009. Now, Dr. West has been awarded University of Arkansas Teacher of the Year Award, and a Carnegie Foundation's Arkansas Professor of the Year Award. In 2001, he received the Baum Faculty Teaching Award. And if you can imagine, in 2009, he was one of three finalists as the outstanding teacher in the United States. This book, Contested Plains, is not about Theodore Roosevelt. He does not appear in the index. Um, but this is uh, one of those books that is a life changing book. You know, you, you only read a handful of books in the course of your life that you say, well, that book changed the way I thought about something really important, and this is one of them. And Dr. West's thesis, if I can try to characterize it just in a paragraph, is that even before Lewis and Clark and Zebulon Pike and others got here, uh, the West had been transformed by the trade of metals, by horses, by diseases brought over by Euro-Americans by dynamics of pioneer culture and westward expansion. And so when Lewis and Clark arrived at the Mandan and Hidatsa villages in October of 1804, they thought they were discovering something, but in fact that landscape and the peoples who lived on it and the flora and fauna were already undergoing a rapid, extraordinary, and even revolutionary transformation. This is one of those pivotal books that you must read if you want to understand the Great Plains or the American West. I want to read just one passage, not from this book, but from an essay that Dr. West wrote about Lewis and Clark, which is my own field, um, in an essay called Finding Lewis and Clark by Looking Away. Dr. West really set the tone for what his keynote address is meant to do for all of us. He says, when we find an intriguing subject, we naturally are drawn into its flow of events. If its details are especially interesting and full of puzzles, we get caught up in chasing every lead into every evidentiary cranny. With that, we tend to lose sight of our subject's wider arena, which leaves us facing an annoying paradox. The more we concentrate on what we study, the less we understand. It's my hope that you can make us understand Theodore Roosevelt and the American West in a new way. Please welcome Dr. Elliot West. Well, gosh. <laughs> Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, thank all of you for coming. Thanks for the uh, invitation here. I've uh, been to Dickinson once before. That's because uh, it was the end of the day and I wanted dinner. Um, so I stopped here, and uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful chance to be here. What a wonderful facility here. And what a wonderful uh, chance to, to meet and to, to talk and learn something more about this part of the country and, and this, uh, this extraordinary man. As Clay said, he and I have worked together several times before, so when he emailed me uh, asking me if I would like to take part, uh, specifically to lead off uh, this conference, um, pretty quickly uh, I think I said, uh, sure, I'd love to do that. Uh, this was on email. Um, I pressed send, and within seconds I thought, what have I done? 
<laughs> I mean, this is this is a conference on Theodore Roosevelt in the West, and it, it's true. I've taught and written about the American West, but Roosevelt—it's the Roosevelt part of it that was a, that was a problem to me, because I'm by, in in no sense of the word uh, a Roosevelt scholar. He's a man that fascinates me and has for many years. I have on my office wall a photograph of uh, Theodore Roosevelt. I purchased a managed to purchase a uh, an autograph. T. Roosevelt, it says, and I sort of framed it uh, below it. Turns out they're pretty cheap because he wrote a lot of them. Uh, he had a lot of them. <laughs> but in any case, uh, he's, he's someone that um, I've, I've followed you know, and, and tried to learn as much as I can about over, over the many years. But I cannot stay, say by any, by any stretch of the imagination that I am uh, an authority on this. And here I am at a conference on this. Not only that, a conference with Edmund Morris. Holy cow. Um, a conference uh, for... Gosh, something like 35 years now, I've taught a course called The West of the Imagination. It's a course on uh, the, the Western, you know, the West in popular culture. I first taught it when I taught in Texas, uh, and the first time I taught it, one of the books that I read uh, preparing for it was uh, G. Edward White's uh, The Eastern Establishment uh, and the Western Experience. It's one of those books uh, that, that Clay was talking about. Uh, as a friend of mine puts it, it rearranges your mental furniture, <laughs> and it uh, made me understand something about the West and popular culture that I'd never really understood before. And so here, here I am at a conference with, uh, with someone who uh, I've been following and admiring now for, uh, for, for decades. So, you know. What the world do I have uh, to say about this? Well, what I can do, I think, is to try to bring uh, something to this conference um, from some of the things that I've learned about the West during these years, to bring Roosevelt into it uh, as, best I, as best I can. You know, the one thing you can say, I think, without question, uh, is that the story of Theodore Roosevelt in the West is <laughs> such a story, you know, such incredible appeal to it. Uh, it has this kind of a almost mythic rhythm to it. You know, it, it begins really you know, following his first his first uh, hunting trip out here. It begins of course in tragedy, profound tragedy. Uh, it proceeds through uh, adventure, uh, some comedy, a kind of a, a kind of an odyssey, a kind of a time of trial out here in the West. Uh, and it ends um, ends in, in with him returning a, a kind of a story of a redemption. Uh, almost, in political terms, almost a resurrection. So it's one of these sort of classic, classic stories. And, and as Clay mentioned, it's one of those stories that, uh, that we get so caught up in, so caught up in that sometimes we miss the larger significance of it. We're so caught up in its, in its humanity, so caught up in its, its drama, uh, and especially, of course, because we know where this guy goes. <laughs> We know where he goes. He goes back east still, such a young man. And then he will proceed over the years uh, to become uh, arguably you know, the most uh, significant, I think certainly the most revelatory figure in the United States of his, of his time. And it somehow is rooted right here in this part, this part of the plains. Such a story. But it's so easy once we get caught up in this story to, to try to, to, to miss the larger context of it. So that's what I would like to, to talk about a bit this evening, to try to put this story in a bit of a larger context, the context of the West, the context of America. As I said, I don't know. There are lots of things I don't know about Roosevelt. There's plenty of things I still don't know about the American West, plenty of things that frankly baffle me about it. But there are three things that I know for certain. I know, number one, that in the 1880s, when Theodore Roosevelt was out here, the United States, this country, was well on its way to becoming, in, in essence, a new nation, a transformed nation. I would argue, too, this evening, that the United States, by the opening of the 20th century, was, in effect, a different country from what it had been even 50 years before. Different in, in so many ways. Different physically, of course, starting in the 1840s with the expansion to the Pacific Coast, adding 1.2 million square miles to it. Different in its economic arrangements, in its economic landscape and contours. Different in its, in its human makeup, who the Americans were. Different in its definitions of citizenship. Different in its, the power and the relationship of the federal government to the regions and the states uh, and the individuals in this country. A new nation essentially a new America. 
And in the 1880s, as Roosevelt was out here, that was underway. I know, secondly, that the American West that Roosevelt visited was coming in itself, coming into focus as a distinctive region in this country. And this Western region would play, was playing, a absolutely critical part in the making of this new America. The two things were absolutely intertwined. <laughs> and finally, and as part of this, of course, uh, as the West came into focus as a region, it was becoming um, what no other region is, and that is the special playground of the popular imagination. Something about the West that has caught the imagination of the people of this country and of the world. We talk about Westerns. Westerns, right? Nobody talks about Southerns. <laughs> God knows uh, Midwesterns, you know, but Westerns, you know. Westerns, one of the true, uh, one of the few, along with the detective story, I think, one of the, um, uh, one of the two cultural exports of this country to the rest of the world. And finally, of course, there's Roosevelt himself. And while there's so much that I don't understand and don't know about Roosevelt, I know one thing about him. And that is that Theodore Roosevelt had this uncanny knack for feeling the pulse of the American people. This uncanny ability to somehow sense uh, what a considerable portion of his nation were feeling, what, they, um, what their aspirations were, uh, what their anxieties and their fears were. He was in touch, in touch with the American public in a way that very, very few people ever are, certainly politicians. And this, of course, is, <laughs> this is the ultimate coin of the realm for a politician to be able to do that. I ask my classes sometimes. Um, for all of the presidents who have really not done much during their administrations, a lot of those guys have ended up popular. We come up with a lot of names for that. Plenty of presidents have done a lot and ended up unpopular. But how many presidents have we had who have been extraordinarily active and ended up as popular or more popular than when they went in. You know, that's a gift. <laughs> and you can count them on about, I think, three or four fingers. Uh, I think Jackson. I think uh, Theodore's cousin, Franklin. I think more, uh, most recently, uh, Reagan, probably. Uh, but certainly among those was Theodore Roosevelt. He must be the only, only <laughs> national politician who had to actively quash an effort to nominate him for president, right? <laughs> That's pretty unusual in 1912. Uh, so what I'd like to do this evening is to try to bring those three points together and to look a bit, to speculate a bit uh, about this remarkable, brilliant young man on his sojourn out west in these pivotal years in his life as he was feeling his way toward those values and beliefs and attitudes and perspectives that would guide him when he became the leader, the president of this new America. And to remember that as he did that, you know, he was searching for those values, finding those values, reaching out for them, feeling for them as he was living in and <laughs> thinking about and experiencing and writing about the American West. I like to do that by, by looking at two areas. Two areas. Two areas that we normally don't associate, I think, with the West of that time. Can we get the slide presentation up here? There we go. Thanks. That we don't associate uh, with the West uh, at that time. Uh, but two areas, two topics. Two questions that were of great concern to many people during those years. And interestingly, um, these same two areas are of great concern to the American people uh, today. They are, first, uh, to use a kind of a shorthand for it, the one that was used back then, big business. That is, the economic contours of this nation that were developing in such a, such a remarkable way during these years, specifically the rise of these sort of giant corporations, uh, these powerful concentrations of capital uh, that were so important uh, and would become uh, such an important part of uh, focus of Roosevelt's uh, presidential years. 
And secondly, to use another shorthand term, uh, race or ethnicity, um, the changing nature of the American people in their racial and their ethnic background. Also, a question of great concern back then, and uh, I think you've noticed probably uh, a question of concern today, specifically back then and today, questions of immigration and how what uh, sort of uh, what sort of challenges uh, this great influx of new people into this country posed for us during those years. First, um, big business. <laughs> These were years, the 1880s up to the turn of the century, these were years of extraordinary change in this country in that regard. Uh, remarkably prosperous years. The United States was on its way to becoming um, what it remains today. That is the economic powerhouse, the 800 pound gorilla of the global economy. And that was happening um, on so many levels in this country. But for all of the good that was happening, that was raising questions for people. Questions regarding um, the power now exerted by these concentrations of capital. Uh, these great new centers of power and capital that uh, had such immediate and intimate impact upon people's lives, and yet were beyond the control and beyond even the understanding of most individuals. How do we deal with that? What sort of questions does that raise? Uh, well, uh, Roosevelt, of course, as a president, would be addressing those kinds of questions. But when we look back to the 1880s uh, and we ask the question, what was Roosevelt thinking about that sort of thing during these years? Where would we look? Where would we look? I think the, um, the first place would be here, this uh, wonderful book. How many of you all have read uh, this book? This is something that uh, you know every fan of Roosevelt uh, uh, has read, I think. It's, um, I think you might say it's a delightful um, piece of work. Uh, it's full of wonderful stories. Uh, it's that uh, distinctive writing style that he had at that time of his life. Uh, you can sort of feel the energy of this young man out there having a great time sort of getting his legs back under him after those uh, awful years uh, in the East. But as you read this book, um, I think you don't have to look into it too far. You don't have to peel apart uh, its parts uh, too much to see Roosevelt uh, as a man, again, much in tune with the people of his time in that Roosevelt was more than a little bit in love with the idea that the American West was the part of the country that was, you know, that, that was uh, part of that older way of life, that older economy. And that in something like ranching specifically, we saw a way of life. We saw a way of making a living uh, that was under siege. And the changes that were afoot back east, of course, would soon overwhelm this way of life. So his treatment of ranching in this, um, in this book um, has that kind of a nostalgic feel to it. Uh, it's full of stories about cowboys and what he calls frontier types uh, out west, full of uh, incidents uh, like this one depicted by his, of course, close friend, Frederick Remington, illustrating, uh, illustrating the book. In this book, he writes, um, uh, he writes about this way of life. The great free ranches with their barbarous picturesque and curiously fascinating surroundings mark a primitive stage of existence as surely as do the great tracts of primeval forests. And like the latter, they must pass away before the onward march of our people. And we who have felt the charm of life and have exulted in its abounding vigor in its bold and restless freedom will not only regret its passing for our own sakes, but must feel also real sorrow that those who come after us are not to see, as we have seen, what is perhaps the pleasantest, healthiest, and most exciting phase of American existence. <laughs> so this is Roosevelt's, the way he experienced ranching, the way he saw it. And he saw it not just as something that he took part in, but he saw this as a stage of American development. The ranchers themselves, here he's not talking about the cowboys, but the ranch owners uh, like himself. <laughs> he describes this way, ranching, that is these ranchers, ranching is an occupation like those of vigorous, primitive, pastoral peoples, having little in common with the humdrum, workaday business world of the 19th century. And the free ranchman, in his manner of life, 
shows more kinship to an Arab sheikh than to a sleek city merchant or tradesman. <laughs> so again, this is how Roosevelt sees this, and when he sees, uh, when he puts this experience into the into the into the context of the changes in American life at that time, he sees this as sort of a last holdout of this older way of life, just on the edge of being overwhelmed by this new economic order of great, you know, of great uh, economic power that is looming in the east and looking westward. Well, what? really was going on then, uh, looking at this. Certainly, of course, in the day-to-day, -day, in the day-to-day -day lives of ranchers and of cowboys, there was plenty of boldness and freedom, plenty of this, of the kind of things that he is alluding to there, uh, as, of course, there are today. <laughs> you know, I'll count as my friends, many friends, uh, across the West, uh, ranchers, ranching families, you know, who's, who stay in that business uh, exactly for those reasons, that sense of freedom, that sense of individuality, that sense of, uh, that sense of, uh, of, of, of uh, being in this uncommon way of life. That's all true. That's all there. But the fact is that ranching, in the years that Roosevelt was experiencing it, Ranching, if you step back a bit and look at it in this larger context, ranching was really one of the very best instances of the new economy. It was really a prime example of the new economic order, the new economic way of life that Roosevelt associated with the East. I mean, what was ranching, after all? Ranching was one more of those examples of local enterprises giving way to this national and, and international uh, economic order, just as cobblers were giving way to shoe factories in Maine, <laughs> just as uh, you know, just as uh, uh, millers and mills were giving way to gigantic enterprises like Pillsbury's chilled roller factory, flour factory in uh, in, um, in the Midwest. Uh, just as thousands of local breweries <laughs> were giving way to the giants like Schlitz and Pabst and Anheuser-Busch, um, so the local butcher was giving way to this now national enterprise that was created by those same kinds of forces that we, uh, that we associate with those better known examples, uh, bringing together of supply and demand. The uh, supply was down there in southern Texas and then later on the Great Plains. The demand up there in the Northeast, bringing that supply and together and demand together uh, by this revolutionary system of technology, the railroad system, far and away the largest and most extensive on, on Earth, connecting the uh, source down in southern Texas first to the Great Plains and then spreading the ranching system up through the Midwest. What we're in the Great Plains and Midwest, what we're seeing here, of course, is a specialization of regions that was such a primary part of this new economic order. All of this was uh, coordinated by what I would argue is the most important breakthrough in the history of human communication, the telegraph which brought all this together, which tied the whole system together, allowed it to operate on a national and then an international scale. All of this was, you know, modernity defined almost. This is what drove ranching. This is what gave the spark to create this new, this create this new industry. And that's what it was. You know, historians call this the cattle raising industry. And it was an industry. It was an industry with its own factories. Slaughterhouses in places like Cincinnati, Chicago, and Kansas City. Basically, you know, beef and pork factories where the animals were slaughtered and the meat processed and then sent out over that same, that same system of, uh, of, of railroads. So this then was, this then was the ranching industry. And this was, um, you know, as prime an example as I can think of of the very kinds of systems that Roosevelt and others thought was back east, you know, and contrasted with the, wor with the, uh, the world that they were living in um, out in the west. Now, of course, there was so much in this way of life uh, that did have that distinctive western tone to it. 
Here is an illustration, of course, of, uh, of Roosevelt's ranch. He wrote about this in Ranch Life uh, with great affection, talking about the, the house uh, with its coat, with its uh, lovely veranda where he would sit and daydream uh, and watch the, uh, the wind blow through the trees. I think he was meaning us, uh, meaning for us to look at this and to see this as a kind of a physical manifestation of this older order. In contrast, in contrast to the to the world that you would see back east, the kinds of uh, the kinds of elaborate mansions that you see in the east, like uh, the breakers of, uh, of Cornelius Vanderbilt in Rhode Island. In contrast to this, you would see uh, you would see ranch houses like these, <laughs> or J.P. Morgan's brownstone in New York City. Contrasted with that. <laughs> or Andrew Carnegie's mansion in Manhattan. Contrasted with that. But looks can be deceiving. <laughs> what were these places? What were these places? This was the headquarters of the Swan Land and Cattle Company. Organized in 1883, the year that Roosevelt came out on his, uh, his first hunt, his first exposure uh, to North Dakota. Uh, its original investment, uh, about $3.75 million. A few years later, it was capitalized at $50 million. In time, it controlled something like 600,000 acres in Nebraska and Wyoming. By far and away, the largest ranch uh, in, in Wyoming, which was dominated, of course, uh, by ranching. The point here is that while you might look at those great mansions and contrast them with these simple structures and think that this is very different ways of life. This represented corporate ranching. These were gigantic international corporations. The Swan Land and Cattle Company, a great example of it. It's, it's uh, you know, controlled by Scott investors. This one, this was the Matador Land and Cattle Company. Founded down in Texas originally, but spread up into Colorado, eventually into the Dakotas and Wyoming. Uh, this one was the also um, also uh, financed uh, by Scott uh, by Scott investors. This is the one that had the famous uh, manager Myrtle McKenzie, a good friend of uh, Theodore Roosevelt. McKenzie, who uh, became a legendary figure on the Northern Plains, and then left that to take uh, the job as a managing a ranch, an even larger ranch, larger than any in the United States, down in Brazil, reminding us that this was an international corporate uh, endeavor. Yeah, this one, the XIT Ranch. I think you've got a photograph of one of the cooks from the XIT out there, out there in the hall. The XIT, of course, uh, the largest, uh, uh, the largest ranch ever, at least on the 48 states. The largest ranch in the United States, uh, in fact, was not in Texas, uh, but in Hawaii, on the large island Hawaii. But this was the largest of the 48 states. It also was founded uh, back in the 1880s, about the time about the time as Roosevelt was coming out here. Uh, this one uh, was financed by the by the um, state government of Texas. Uh, they wanted a new capital building, so they offered three million acres in the Texas Panhandle for anyone who would agree to build them a new capital. <laughs> Some Chicago real estate investors took them up on it. These men had made millions um, rebuilding Chicago after the Great Fire, and now they uh, they took up uh, the the. Uh, offer from the state of Texas. They built the state capital. They sold bonds in uh, Britain and Germany uh, to, finance this, um, to finance this ranch in the Texas Panhandle uh, that once at one time had 3,000 miles of barbed wire fence. <laughs> the point, of course, is that ranching, the ranching that Roosevelt was taking part in, and these are the same years when he was coming out to the Dakotas, uh, was in this way also, you know, a prime example of the new economic order. In this case, uh, gigantic uh, corporate concentrations of money brought to bear, brought to bear on the land. And there's another way in which this ranching um, reflected these new trends. Uh, these large businesses also were often in partnership with the government, a kind of a, a kind of a um, give and take between this, uh, these large pools of capital and, and the federal government. Um, and ranching, when you think about it, was another 
instance of this. Uh, the government was providing what was, after all, the fundamental fuel of ranching, grass, the public domain. Many of these large ranchers uh, would, uh, would buy up the land along the, along the streams uh, to control the water. If you control the water, you control everything. Uh, and then they would allow the, and then they would turn their cattle loose on the free range, uh, which was, after all, public land. So it was a partnership in this sense. The railroads that, that um, the railroads that were so important to the emergence of ranching were a, an even more dramatic example of this, uh, as the government provided uh, absolutely, uh, almost unimaginable amounts of land to the railroads to construct these transcontinentals that then allowed industries, allowed businesses like these ranches to, um, uh, to operate. This shows these land grants along the way here. Giving an instance, uh, an example of how much land we're talking about compared to the amount of land taken up by homesteads. Now homesteads, that was an instance of this older economic order. That's the kind of image that Roosevelt had and others had of Western life. How much land, and the government, of course, was providing land for those folks, too. But comparatively speaking, how did they match up? By 1880, the government had given about, uh, about 20 million acres, had been proved up under homesteads. How about for the railroads? 127 million acres. And there was still more to come. It, it, it's difficult to put your brain around <laughs> how much land we're talking about here. Uh, a recent book by Richard White, Railroad Today, a, a, a history of the new history of the transcontinental railroads. Well, Richard um, think, uh, puts it this way. He said, if you take all of the land given by the federal government to these railroads to build these western railroads and put it all together, it would be the third largest state in the Union. Alaska, Texas, and then what he calls Railroadiana. <laughs> and no better example uh, can be found for that than the Northern Pacific, the railroad that, um, that of course, goes through, or used to go through, I guess it's, it's what the Burlington Northern now, the, um, uh, through Dickinson, uh, the Northern Pacific, that you know, was the lifeblood, was the, you know, the primary artery, economic artery uh, for North Dakota. The amount of land given by the federal government to the Northern Pacific alone to this one railroad uh, was more than the size of New England. It's as if giving New England and a little bit more to one company. To put that in perspective of, of North Dakota, if I sort of put this together. <laughs> Can you see that little thin blue line over on the far left, a bit west of where we are right now? The amount of land given to the Northern Pacific would cover everything in North Dakota east of that line. The entire state of North Dakota except for that little strip over to the, uh, over to the far west. <laughs> so, you know, ranching so much in the west that was uh, allowed by this system of railroads uh, was, you know, showed every one of those characteristics that we normally associate with the new economy with the new American landscape. Ranching was one of the best examples of it that I can think of, and what's especially fascinating is that it was the first. Every one of those other industries that we normally associate with this new economy you know, really comes after ranching. It paved the way. It opened the way for this. It emerges, after all, right after the Civil War, at the very earliest moments of the Gilded Age. Now what makes this fascinating to me, looking at this as a Western historian and putting Roosevelt into this context, uh, is the fact that the young Roosevelt, the Roosevelt, you know, uh, in his, with his adventures out in North Dakota, buys into this. This is the way he sees it. And yet if we follow him ahead, follow him ahead, we see this same man as president grappling with this new economic order. <laughs> wrestling <laughs> with exactly those kinds of concentrations of power <laughs> that we see exemplified in the ranching of his, of his early years. I wonder sometimes uh, whether he looked back you know, 
as a mature, as a mature politician, look back from his presidential years as he's as he's wrestling with people like Morgan and others, or in the railroads in particular. Uh, and I wonder if he ever thought about that. You know, that in fact, in his younger years, uh, he had been squarely in the middle of this process. <laughs> In, its, in some of its earlier earliest stages. In any case, uh, I think putting this in this larger perspective, that we can see we can see Roosevelt um, as the man who was, after all, the first president of the new America to begin to come to grips with this question that is still very much with us today. You know, what should be the relationship between the federal government and these concentrations of business power? <laughs> You know, there are a few issues in American politics today you know, as pertinent uh, and as hot as that one. And we can look back here and we can see, I think, uh, a glimmering, an early glimmering of exactly that question in the life of this, um, of this remarkable man. The second, the second question, um, as I said, was race. <laughs> and I use that, as I said, as kind of a shorthand. What I'm really talking about here is the, the human makeup of the United States as it moved into this, uh, this extraordinary time, as it moved through this extraordinary time, it was on its way to being this, this new America, this transformed America. I think it's arguable that the United States between, let's say, 1850 and, eight, and 1910, 1860, let's say, 1860, the time of the Civil War, and 1910, during that short half century, the United States changed in its human makeup relatively more than in any other comparable time in our history. You know, think about that. <laughs> Beginning, of course, with emancipation. Now, African Americans have been here for 300 years, but the American citizenry in 1865, suddenly four million persons of color were introduced into American citizenship. By that time, we had expanded to the Pacific, which meant we, that the American embrace uh, was now around tens of thousands of Indian peoples. Indians out west, unlike those of the east, unlike the Cherokees and the uh, Delawares and the others, uh, these Indians, these people had never had the slightest exposure to American institutions. <laughs> The gold rush brought, you know, made California easily the most polyglot, the most extraordinary collection of humanity from across the globe to be found in any place, any place on earth uh, at that time. And then, of course, what, what was foremost in the minds of so many people, uh, this surge of immigration from Europe, the so-called new immigration. Immigrants coming now increasingly from southern and eastern Europe. Uh, rather than from the British Isles and um, the British Isles and elsewhere, so this country, you know, between say 1860 and 1910, which just in its, in its human face, you know, was radically transformed. That was also part of the new America, and that, like the questions around big business and economics, that preyed upon the thinking of the American people. It bothered a lot of people. It bothered Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> Where would we look to get Roosevelt's ideas on this? Specifically in the case of the West. Um, well, we begin, of course, with the Indians. Uh, he didn't write a lot about Indians. Uh, he does have a chapter in Ranch Life uh, on Indian white relations and on Indians generally. Um, I think he claimed to be, in, that he, he, in so many words, he claimed to be something of, of an authority on Indians. He, uh, but in his writing about them, he, he sort of falls into uh, the typical cliches of the time. Uh, he sees good Indians and bad Indians. Uh, at one point, he says that the Nez Perces differ from the Apaches as much as a Scott Laird does from a Calabrian bandit. <laughs> uh, this, of course, uh, as far as I know, uh, comes from a man who had never seen either a Nez Perce uh, or an Apache. Um, but uh, again, the point here is that he's, you know, he's, he's, uh, this is a very common trope uh, of that particular period. And yet, uh, even though there are good guys like the Nez Perce and the Pueblos uh, and the Cherokees, um, for the most part, when Roosevelt, and we're, again, Please remember, this is the young Roosevelt. 
This is the Roosevelt of the 1880s. Uh, when he writes about Indians, it tip, they typically it typically falls into this sort of common uh, these common uh, descriptions of a sort of backward savage people. Uh, who have no inherent right to the land because they're not using it properly, uh, and who then must give way uh, to this um, uh, to this new order. He um, he continues to speak of them in that way, even as even as president, uh, when he uh, when he referred to the insurrectionists in the Philippines. <laughs> if you read his comments on that, very often he will call them Apaches uh, and Comanches. <laughs> Sometimes you get the impression that he was really irritated uh, that the Western Indians had surrendered uh, before he got out there uh, so he could fight them. So he sort of projects them out there to the, uh, uh, across, the, across the Pacific. In a letter in the 1880s written uh, from his time out here, a letter that uh, you, you see quoted um, fairly often, he wrote, I don't go so far as to think that the only good Indians are dead Indians, but I believe nine out of ten are. And I shouldn't like to inquire too closely in the case of the 10th. <laughs> uh, he also wrote on the Sand Creek Massacre in his biography of, uh, of Thomas Hart Benton. Uh, I, and uh, Clay mentioned uh, a book. Uh, in, my, in that book, I, I researched the Sand Creek uh, episode uh, very closely. Uh, and it's, this is not a pretty, not a pretty story. Uh, Roosevelt wrote of this. Uh, of this uh, massacre, he said, while there were, quote, certain objectionable details, on balance, he said, it was as righteous and beneficial a deed as ever happened on the frontier. <laughs> again, this is the early, the early Roosevelt. And again, this is common, this is, the, you know, the common take of that day. There's nothing in that that is, you know, that you couldn't say about so many other writers of that particular period. The main cause of concern in this question of, of the changing face of the new America for folks, however, had not to do with Indians, but with the new immigration, with these new um, groups of folks coming into this country. There's some, I threw in a picture of the Hidatsas here since um, I'm in North Dakota. But a much greater concern were um, folks like this flooding in through, uh, flooding in through the uh, through the East Coast. People who were coming from, as I said, from Southern and Eastern Europe. People for who, for many of the old stock Americans, uh, those uh, who had been here for many generations, those sort of long-tailed families uh, of the East, in particular those of Roosevelt's uh, of Roosevelt's lineage, those of his of his social uh, class. Uh, this was this was disturbing. These were people with, um, you know, who sp spoke in strange languages. <laughs> people who practiced uh, questionable religions. Uh, people who lived by strange and exotic customs. <laughs> people who smell strongly of garlic. Uh, uh, and this was, uh, again, this, there was nothing unusual in Roosevelt in this in this regard. But these were these were issues. These were questions that um, that bothered people of that particular background. Uh, Roosevelt, uh, and Roosevelt was no, was no exception. Uh, most, uh, I think, best known in his attitudes and his writings were uh, his, uh, his professions of what he called race suicide. Uh, he was, of course, famous uh, for saying that it was the absolute duty uh, of every uh, proper American family uh, to produce as many children, many children as possible. Uh, the duty of every American male, he said, was to work, fight, and breed. Uh, and he talked about the warfare of the cradle. He said the you know the old stock Americans have got to keep up, got to keep up with these newer folks who are coming in and are producing producing so many children. Um, as president, I just learned this in doing this uh, researching, uh, work, working on this talk. 1906, 1906, President Roosevelt, in his address to Congress, proposed a federal amendment to bring federal control over marriage and divorce uh, in this country. <laughs> you know, this, is, of course, has a very contemporary touch to it. <laughs> this is uh, the very thing that is being proposed. Uh, in this case, the question, of course, of uh, uh, same-sex marriage. Wouldn't you have loved to hear his thoughts on that? Uh, what, 
<laughs> I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure where he would uh, come down uh, uh, on that question. Um, he also um, later um, uh, later in his life uh, proposed two of my favorite of his uh, proposals. One of them um, that the uh, federal government should give certain economic preferences to parents with three or more children, uh, and my absolute all-time favorite, the salaries of public officials should be uh, gauged by how many children they had. In other words, if you, if, you were a, if you were a public official and refused to produce children, um, you'd never get above the lowest pay level. Uh, on the other hand, uh, well, uh, I have five children. I think it's a terrific uh, way to approach, uh, to approach salaries. <laughs> so. This was uh, this is a man then who uh, who really up until the end of his life was expressing uh, was expressing uh, to a degree these these sorts uh, of concerns, uh, including a control of immigration um, in 1894 in an article in the in the Forum, uh, an article True Americanism. He said we need much more drastic laws on immigration that now exist. We need to sort of clamp down on this immigration and control it. Then there was a the case of his friendships. <laughs> At this time, there were those who took these ideas of concern over you know, this, the new immigration uh, to remarkable extremes. And it's not a part of our history this, these years that we, you know, that we are especially comfortable with, most of us. Uh, but there were those who said that, uh, who came up with racial theories of Aryan supremacy and who were, well, they call themselves race scientists, and who were in favor of eugenics that is, of uh, sort of breeding controls in this country uh, to make sure that the right sorts of Americans were, uh, were born. This was probably the best known of them, Madison Grant, but there were really three of them. Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was the uh, director of the um, New York Museum of Natural History. John Merriam. These were, these were the big three of the American eugenics movement. And of these three, the first two, Grant and Osborne, uh, were close friends of Roosevelt and lifetime correspondence with him. They exchanged dozens of letters uh, with them, many of them on these, on these particular topics. Uh, Grant, in particular, is probably the uh, most important of these, and Grant was the author of the book that really was kind of the Bible of this whole movement, The Passing of the Great Race. When this book came out, uh, Roosevelt um, immediately ordered a copy, uh, read it at uh, Sagamore Hill, uh, and wrote uh, to his friend Grant. He said, this is a capital book in purpose, in vision, and grasp of the facts that our people must uh, most need to realize. And he said that all Americans should be sincerely grateful to you uh, for writing it. This was blurbed on the back of the book uh, for, uh, for future editions. Now, Again, let me emphasize, uh, these ideas, uh, while we find them in, uh, uncomfortable and uh, in some cases bizarre, uh, this was the air that many people were breathing at the time. The folks of Roosevelt's crowd, that, of, of, his, of his world, uh, this is a very common, very common idea. Don't, you know, don't take the idea that he was um, that unusual in this. Uh, he was really pretty much, especially the younger Roosevelt, pretty much along the lines of so many, of so many others. Uh, well, what does this have to do uh, with the West? What do these, how do these people relate this to the West? And here is where, as a Western historian, this gets, uh, this gets kind of interesting. Because when these folks with these concerns looked westward, they saw the West as kind of the last bastion of the true Americans, you know, the old stock Americans, just as they were looking westward in the economic changes of the time and seeing the West as sort of the last stand of this earlier, simpler order. In this case, they were sort of riding off the east, the Atlantic coast, uh, as you know, already hopelessly overwhelmed by these changes, and putting their faith, putting their faith out west. Now, as far as I know, Roosevelt himself did not write, or did not write extensively uh, along those lines. But what we can say, we can say uh, for certain, is that others very close to Roosevelt did. Uh, certainly, his. 
two closest friends who were uh, like Roosevelt in love with the West and doing so much to uh, create this uh, image of the West that was emerging in the latter part of the 19th century. Certainly they shared, they shared these beliefs, no one more so than this man, Frederick Remington, who wrote um, in the early 1890s. Um, that, uh, as I can find the quote here, yes. Um, he said that they that the that this uh, part of America was uh, was the last sort of the last bastion uh, for these folks, and he said that um, when it, the time came, he would take his Winchester down from over the uh, over the um, uh, over the mantle, and would proceed uh, to killing uh, these uh, these foreign swarms who were coming in coming in from the Atlantic coast. Uh, this is perhaps best summed up um, by uh, a man named uh, man named uh, William Jackson Palmer the founder of Colorado Springs, when he wrote back uh, to his wife uh, his vision of the West. He said, we shall have out West a new and better civilization. Only may the people never get as thick as on the eastern seaboard. We shall surrender that briny border as a sort of extensive castle garden to receive and filter the foreign swarms and prepare them by a gradual process for the coming into the inner temple of Americanism out in Colorado. <laughs> well, uh, that was the kind of idea then that you uh, that you would hear among these fellows. Grant was certainly a Madison Grant was a certainly a believer that. So was uh, so was Remington. As was as was Owen Wister, Roosevelt's other close friend, uh, who was uh, caught up in this same uh, in the same idea. Uh, Wister's the Virginian, which of course is dedicated to his friend uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, Worcester's Virginia can be read and often has been read as a kind of a hymn uh, to the sort of the old stock, the best of the old stock America of the East uh, that saves itself by going out to the West. The Virginian, the cowboy coming out West and then marrying uh, the New England schoolmarm uh, from the Northeast, uh, Bali, the best of those two older worlds um, out, in the, out in the West, saving, saving the old stock uh, America. Worcester later uh, would write an article in American Magazine called, Shall We Let the Cuckoos Crowd Us Out of Our Nests? <laughs> Cuckoos, of course, the birds that you know, occupy the nests of the nests of others. And he said, Alien eggs are being laid in our American nest. Our native spirit is being diluted and polluted by organized minorities every hour of the day. Let us awake from the lethargy and take every step, great and small, that we can to keep our inheritance. So to these guys then, to these folks, the West, just as to others, the West was the, uh, you know, the last stand of this older economic order. To these folks, uh, the West was the last stand of this older uh, ethnic order. And it must be saved, protected for that. This, as a Western historian, this has some fascinating and ironic wrinkles to it. And it moves, it, it, it takes us in some really interesting, interesting rec, uh, directions uh, that to me, you know, would be unpredictable. For instance, uh, conservation. Roosevelt, the famous conservation. Now here's one area, of course, in which we associate Theodore uh, with the West. Saving our national forests. The Boone and Crockett Club organized hard upon his time out here in, in, uh, in North Dakota, yeah. organized at a dinner uh, soon after he got back. This club dedicated to the saving of uh, the dwindling populations of large game animals out west. The American Bison Society, to save the animal that was uh, so close to extermination. Roosevelt, the first honorary, uh, the first president, of course, of the Boone and Crockett Club. Uh, Roosevelt, the first honorary president of the American Bison Society. The Wildlife Refuge System today, established under Roosevelt's uh, presidency. Organizations like the Save the Redwoods League. All of these things we associate with Roosevelt and all of these things that are in, of course, we, we applaud uh, and see this as one of the great accomplishments. Uh, but there was this interesting wrinkle to conservation that ties in, believe it or not, with these questions, these questions of race. Here's Roosevelt, 
standing in front of one of the redwoods out in California. If you go out to California today to uh, the Redwood State Park, uh, you might visit this tree. It's called the Founders Tree. It's a tree dedicated to the founders of the Save the Redwoods League. Over here to the right, uh, there is a plaque honoring those, uh, those founders. And who are they? What are the three names of the founders on the plaque? It's Grant, Osborne, and Miriam. <laughs> these men, all three of these men, Grant in particular, uh, were far better known in their earlier career as conservationists. Grant, in fact, saw himself essentially as a conservationist. And he saw a direct connection, a direct parallel between conserving these dwindling resources out west, these, these living resources that he considered so essential to what America was all about, whether they were redwoods or bison or eagles or the other wildlife, and in his own mind, preserving, conserving what he considered other essential elements of the true Americans. That is, those people of his particular, those his particular uh, ethnic background. He was, uh, after Roosevelt uh, stepped down from the Boone and Crockett Club, it was Madison Grant who was the president, long-running president, of the Boone and Crockett Club. Madison Grant was really the founding spirit behind the American Bison Society. They turned the presidency of it to William Hornaday, a much, well, much better known man, and of course the honorary president, the President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. But it was Grant, really, Grant, who, really, who, was, the, who was the founder. The first bison refuge out west, um, in the Wichita Mountains in, um, in, in Oklahoma. Uh, was established as a forest preserve, but then made uh, one of the very first wildlife preserves. It was there that the first bison were taken out. Were taken out. Um, and this was the brainchild of Madison Grant. It was Madison Grant, the eugenicist. It was Madison Grant, then the Aryan supremacist, uh, who saw this as just as important um, and directly related uh, to the uh, to to that uh, particular that particular concern. Very very odd bed bedfellows <laughs> indeed. And the first bison uh, taken out west were to the were to the Wichita refuge. Uh, they were taken from the Bronx Zoo the New York Zoological Society. Uh, it had been founded by, um, among others, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Madison Grant, and Henry Fairfield uh, Osborne. <laughs> well, one thing you can say about this, well, again, to, to reiterate, what these guys did, what these guys did was to look west and to see the west then as this last refuge of the true Americans, the real Americans. And turning back to the east then, they looked at that part of the country and they said, well, you know, it's pretty much, pretty much a lost cause. What Palmer called the briny coast of the, um, of the east as opposed, you know, to the, uh, to the true America out west. And once again, as with this economic order, um, they got it just about exactly backwards. <laughs> if you look at the question, you know, ask the question, uh, of all the states along the Atlantic coast, which had the highest percentage of foreign-born persons? At the top were Massachusetts and New York. About one out of every four persons in 1880 had been born outside of this country. What if you went west? What would you see? Those eight states out west all had higher percentages of foreign-born persons than either Massachusetts or New York. If you were to t put them all together, Massachusetts and New York, that is the most ethnically, uh, that is the states in the, in the briny coast of the Atlantic uh, that with the highest portion of those, uh, of those foreign swarms, would rank ninth and tenth out west in terms of foreign born, in terms of aliens. In fact, of all states and territories in all of American history, the one that has had the highest percentage of persons who were either born outside of this country or with one or both parents 
born outside of this country. That is the highest percentage of persons who were either first or second generation alien of all states and territories. The one with the highest percentage has been North Dakota. <laughs> the opening of the 20th century, 70%, seven out of every 10 North Dakotans in the latter part, in the, at the end of the 19th century, had either been born outside of the United States or had one or both parents born outside the United States. <laughs> so in other words, people like William Jackson Palmer and Frederick Remington, if they wanted to escape the foreign swarms, they needed to go to Massachusetts. <laughs> so this is a very, you know, a very, a very, a very strange situation. Where did Roosevelt? stand on these issues. As I said, as I said, if you look at his writings, uh, again, the younger Roosevelt, we see him saying, uh, we hear him saying these, these uh, uncomfortable things, frankly, about Indians. If we look at Roosevelt and the question of, uh, of, you know, the racial makeup of this country, we hear him saying things that, you know, are, are, are really uh, not that far away from the things that are being said by people like Madison Grant. Uh, but look more closely. Look more closely. Here is where it gets interesting. Follow Roosevelt. Follow him. Just as we follow Roosevelt out of the Badlands to the presidency as it begins to grapple with this question of big business. If we follow Roosevelt through his adulthood into his years as president, we hear the different things. We hear him change his view on this. For example, he writes to Henry Fairfield Osborne, the eugenicist. Apparently, Osborne, we don't have the letter that Osborne wrote, uh, but apparently Osborne wrote and was talking to him about the, the hopeless situation of Indians out west, specifically talking about Oklahoma. Roosevelt wrote back, he said, Sir, uh, in my regiment in Cuba, there were 50 men of Indian blood. Almost all of them mixed blood, he said, which of course is the ultimate horror uh, for these eugenicists. And uh, this is a, admittedly a little uh, condescending, but it says they behaved, they behaved exactly like the whites and their careers since then have been exactly like the white men's. And he goes on to say that he's received many delegations from Oklahoma, and he says these people are perfectly civilized, perfectly civilized. <laughs> he came around, in fact, to arguing, uh, so the answer, you know, to the problem of the Indian problem, what people see as Indian problem, is uh, interbreeding. Again, breeding is the answer. In this case, he said, mix the races, mix the races, uh, and this will bring about the best, uh, the best of both. The point to stress here, I think, on this question of race is that Roosevelt, the maturing Roosevelt, came to have this deep and abiding faith in the ability, the power of simply living in this country to break down all of these racial and ethnic barriers and to produce a kind of a common American identity. That is really what he came to believe. And while he was concerned with these racial differences, he said, that's the answer. That, then, is the answer. We must bring all of these people together into this common American purpose. That's the point he was making, I think, to Osborne about the Indians of Oklahoma. There's a fascinating letter that he wrote to a, a journalist who had come across that quote that I read to you earlier. Remember, the, uh, I'm not saying that all Indians, uh, the only good Indians are dead Indians, but nine out of ten, that sort of thing. Uh, this guy had come across this letter, and he asked Roosevelt permission to reprint it. And the president wrote him back. He said, I must ask you not to publish that letter of mine about the Indians. The reason is this. That letter was written 18 years ago, and it's 1885. Extraordinary changes have taken place in the country of which I wrote during those 18 years. For 18 years on the frontier is as long time as a century in the older civilized regions. And he went on to say that now there's been no violence out there and now in fact what we see out there is this magical process of Americanization with Indian peoples becoming part of this uh, common of this common society. And of course the to Roosevelt the Roosevelt, the president, the, 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 the way in which this was best exemplified was through politics. And he ends, his, he ends the letter, some of the Indians in North Dakota now not only vote, but they actually go to political conventions. It's <laughs> astonishing. Uh, now, he doesn't say which conventions. Um, I suppose he might have thought that you know, if they went to the Democrats, they're on sort of a lower stage of civilization, but they were moving up uh, toward the Republican Party. 
no. So in other words, what Roosevelt was, what Roosevelt was expressing, uh, what he came around uh, to express, what he came around to embrace, uh, was the notion of what we would come to call, of course, the melting pot. And this was about as far as you could get from those racial theorists in that day. What he did, even, even at the time that he was continuing his friendship with people like Madison Grant, he was coming around to the notion that uh, America is a place in which all of these peoples could, could over time, uh, become a part of this common, common American experience and common American society. Uh, the term melting pot has an interesting history. Uh, it was coined by this uh, man, Israel Sangwill, in this uh, play that he wrote, 1912. This phrase very quickly became part uh, of the American vernacular. And this idea, of course, the whole idea expressed in this play, wa in this play was, uh, uh, was the kind of thing, you know, that just drove people like Madison Grant and the other racial theorists exactly right up the wall. The last thing in the world that they wanted was this kind of coming together of these peoples. Uh, and this was uh, the opposite extreme for me. This was the man who wrote it. He, in fact, was involved also in establishing Jewish colonies in the American Plains. Something that would have you know, driven Remington nuts. <laughs> and if you look at this book and open up, open up to its frontispiece, beyond its frontispiece, this is what you will see. The play, The Melting Pot, is dedicated to Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> In fact, Roosevelt was a frequent correspondent with Zangwill as well as with Madison Grant. And later, uh, in 1912, Zhang Will wrote him a letter and said, uh, Mr. President, um, do you ever think about this play? And Roosevelt wrote him back and said, Sir, indeed I do. He said that this was a, a play, uh, as he put it, um, that was among the very strong and real influences upon my thought and my life. It, it expresses the great ideals which are just as essential for the native born as for the foreign born if this nation is to make its rightful contribution to the sum total of human achievement. <laughs> so what are, we, what are we to make to make of all of this? Um, I think a few, a few points. Uh, first, what we see is this, for one thing, is this emerging America, this emerging new America, grappling with questions that are startlingly familiar to us uh, today. Uh, the question of the power of business, the proper relationship of government to business, to what extent should government regulate business, the kind of questions uh, that are very much a part of the uh, political landscape uh, today. The question of the human makeup, and specifically the questions of immigration and the changing nature uh, of American society and the kind of challenges that that poses and how the government should respond to that. This was part of the world that, uh, that Roosevelt was going through. Uh, what we see here is Roosevelt's West playing you know, very unexpected roles in this. Very you know, different from what we normally think of what was going out there. The West, in fact, is a great place, a great laboratory for studying uh, so much of this. And finally, we see uh, this remarkable young man himself uh, moving, uh, evolving uh, from his young uh, cliched views on these questions uh, toward ones that were far more complex, far more nuanced uh, than, we, uh, than they were before, and far more, I think, reflective, far more reflective of what the Americans were speaking, were thinking generally, and, and what Americans uh, think uh, today. Given all that, I think the final, most obvious point, perhaps, to make is that Roosevelt's West and Roosevelt have at least one thing in common. <laughs> they are both easily misunderstood. They are both easily underestimated. And consequently, both are far too easily given uh, to caricatures. In fact, both of them uh, were far more complex, far more subtle, far more subtle in their, in their nature than we have given them credit for. And we begin to understand that and begin to appreciate those complexities, um, then perhaps we have something to learn uh, about this new America, about our America, uh, that both the West and the Roosevelt uh, shaped so profoundly. Thanks very much.
Okay, some questions. Thank you. Thank you.